Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. And I would like to thank Bob and the committee for inviting me to be here uh, among a lot of people who have been friends for a long time and who are people I've respected and looked up to for a lot of years. And uh, like Scott, I'm really, uh, uh, really don't belong um, (laughs) at all. Uh, Bob told me my subject this morning is to be sex and fear, which are the building blocks for any AA relationship. Um, uh, um, I have to tell you something. I have pushed this topic away from my head ever since Bob asked me to speak here. I don't like to think about sex, and I don't like to think about fear. And I don't like to think about, well, I don't like, it's not that I don't like to think about sex, because I do pretty much every eight minutes uh, that rolls around in my head. I uh, don't need to think about fear because it's always sitting on my shoulders. And, uh, but I think it's better, it's probably more honest for me to just muddle through this and put you through it too. You understand. I am. Um, whenever I think one is given the subject of sex at an AA meeting, everything that comes out of your mouth becomes a double entendre, <laughs> whether you intend it to be or not. Um, Everybody's nervous about sex, even though there are a lot of people who have a lot of bravado regarding sex. I'm not one of them. Um, Sex has been... (laughs) Where do you start in a topic like this? I don't know. Um, How about my first sexual experience? That might be... um... (laughs) No, I'll tell you about it because it will give you an idea of exactly what the problem is. And I'll be gentle about this. Uh, I know it's the women's domain to get up here and talk about being a slut, and men get put down when they do it, but I'll just be as delicate as I can. Um, Because I'm no slut. You can take one look at me and know that I couldn't give it away. But I... um, (laughs) But... uh, I I keep my clothing on as a public service, if you know what I mean. (laughs) When... I've never told this story in AA. Probably will never tell it again. When I was 19... Now, I've been on hormone alert since I was about nine. I know that we have seven deadly sins. There's, you know, gluttony and avarice and fear and guilt, anger and guilt and and sloth and lust, all that stuff. I'm not a gambler, so I can't take that as a virtue that I don't have a gambling problem because I never was interested in gambling. I was never interested in overeating. So I'm not a virtuous person when it comes to food. I just don't have that problem. But I've always had a little pilot light inside when it came to sex. I was raised Catholic. Uh, I was raised, as Sandy mentioned the other night, that there, there's a God, and, and he... Uh, and this is sort of a, a, an a, a addendum to what you said about God having loved his only son and, and killed him. Uh, and, and where does that leave us? But, uh, <laughs> but I... Uh, I was led to believe that God gave me instincts, including sexual, otherwise there wouldn't be other people, which would have been fine with me. Uh, but that's an entire different evening. But I, uh, I've always felt that God gave us all these things to grapple with, you know, just wrestle with that stuff about, you know, feeling attracted to women all the time and having that, you know, just want to 
you know, uh, the imperious urge, as the book calls it. And, um, but I know, too, that if you do it, you're going to get punished. You're going to be punished because you committed a mortal sin then. So it's like leaving the bowl out for the dog with food in it, and when he eats it, smacking him upside the head with a baseball bat, you know. Um, it just doesn't seem fair to me. And, and people say, well, life isn't fair. Well, that's not enough for me. That's not, that explanation is not enough. And, uh, and God loves you. But, but don't you use that urge. So, so consequently, I spent my sexual maturity years revving the engine at about 5,000 RPMs in park. Um, so, so I was working in a motorcycle shop, <laughs> scoff if you will, um, I hung out and drank with bikers. Those are the people who taught me how to drink. I love bikers. I love rebels. I'm a rebel myself. I just didn't tell anybody. But I, uh, um, and it was in this motorcycle shop that this young woman worked named Linda, but they called her Rabbit. I didn't get it at the time, but that was her nickname. See, anytime you say anything about what regards sex, it's going to go there. And, um, but Linda worked there, and Linda invited me over to her house to have dinner with her and her husband one night. And it's 1969, and I went over there, you know, and uh, was going to go over and have dinner with Linda. And, you know, the guys in the shop would walk by and go, oh, you having dinner with Linda? You know, and uh, I, th- I thought, because I'm stupid, I don't get it. And um, so I went to have dinner with Linda and uh, her husband, his name was... Uh, Corky, and Corky was going to go to work. He worked the night shift. And they had a one-year-old child who was there, and the child went to bed, the little boy went to bed, and was sleeping in the next room of this apartment. And Corky got up and said, well, i got to go to work. It was good meeting you. You guys have a good time, and I'll, I'll talk. And he left. And one thing led to another, and I don't, because I was drinking glass after glass of wine in anticipation of this, didn't know what was going to happen. And it happened. And I left with her son in the next room, on the couch of that house, of that apartment, I went home that night and I felt so full of shame, remorse. I felt filthy inside. I felt like I had, I had just cut myself away from everything that my parents had tried to teach me, that the church had taught me, all the stuff that I was supposed to do to be a good boy. I just pushed aside. I'd gotten drunk. I had sex with a married woman with her child in the next room, and I felt disgusting. So... The next night when I was back at Linda's house, (laughs) um, you don't even need to know. Uh, I'll let you just take it from there. Um, That's my experience with sex, um, is a moment of... It's like anything with alcohol. See, alcoholism is not the fact that, as, as the other speakers will tell you, and as Clancy said last night and Scott said today, that it's not about how much alcohol I drank or what, alcohol, what I did under the influence of alcohol. Alcohol relieved me of all that guilt and shame and embarrassment to go ahead and do it again. Because the anticipation that alcohol gives me about any situation that's about to happen is greater than anything I can ever think of. I never got any anticipation during prayer, you know? I never got any anticipation of something great about to happen in the middle of a rosary, you know? I don't say that to mock people who are Catholic either. I just never got that same anticipation. But when I started drinking, oh man, I'm riding the wave, you know? I'm on it and it makes me feel better. And I can can rationalize and eliminate all that guilt and remorse when I drink alcohol. And so, and as someone who has always felt I hate the term less than is so it's an incomplete sentence. I just felt like I was not up to speed with the rest of the human race, especially males. I wasn't like a guy's guy. I, I don't like football. You can tell that my uh, my hockey ga- days are ahead of me, and I uh, <laughs> am just am not into that stuff. I like literature. I like 
read I like stuff that's a little more sedate because I was always sick when I was a child and, and I've always been embarrassed about who I am and what I am and I don't know where that came from it certainly didn't come from my parents they never imposed any of that stuff on me when I was at my 10 year high school reunion um, I had a crush on a girl named Joan in my my high school class I mean I thought she was just it and I, lo- I just adored her from afar but Joan was I think dating one of the Green Bay Packers at the time and she was just a great but she was she was great great you know she was like a prototype hippie type and she was hot and um i never said a word to her you know and so i went to my 10-year reunion and i went with my then wife and walked in and the first person i saw was joan and she came running up and said hello and she's turned to my wife and said i had the biggest crush on your husband when i was in high school <laughs> yeah my first reaction was <laughs> Why didn't you say anything, you tart? You know, uh, well, now it all comes out when nothing can happen. Now my wife knows, you know, and, and, it's that, and then that sense of, and it's like Sandy was saying, there's the, there's the childhood I had and the childhood I remembered. I remembered not her being unattainable. And then I realized 10 years later that she actually liked me. God damn it. It's like, no, I mean, I... <laughs> That's what I, how I felt, because I never drank in the morning except on weekends. And uh, I came to AA. I used to just, I mean, would weather savage hangovers to where my, I thought my eyes would start bleeding. And would weather those through the day until finally I'd hit the point, as every alcoholic does, where the hangover goes from being more intense and more intense until you think your head is going to pop. And then it, go, it goes click and it becomes somewhat less intense than it had been just a moment before and i just think oh boy i don't know why i made all those promises to quit drinking now i feel great now and uh and i go back out and and uh that's how that's how my life was i I would i would fight drinking in the morning because alcoholics drink in the morning and i'm not an alcoholic and then i get to aa and people say yeah, you know that I'd have wake up with a terrible hangover, I'd take a couple of shots of bourbon, and I felt 100% better. It went away. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I toughed it out. I toughed that crap out, and now I hear from people that you take a couple of shots of bourbon in the morning and you feel better? That, that was one of the, that's another one of those God damn it moments, you know? <laughs> so my... <laughs> My sexual life, along with my drinking life, has been a sequence of God damn it moments. Um, I'm a writer now. I haven't always been, but I I am now, and that's how I make a living. And and I'm working on a story on my own, and it involves weapons, which you can, again... um, But I didn't know much about weapons, so I have a friend in my group who's, uh, who was an ex-sniper, and he, uh, I call him when I have a weapons question, because I don't know anything about him, and he gives me the technical information, and, I'm, and it's great, you know. And, and I, I was redoing some reading on the Internet, and I read that a, a gun, if you fire a gun, the bullet comes out of the barrel at 400 feet per second. That's a wallop. But if you take that same gun and you shoot it into a swimming pool... Oh, you shoot it into a swimming pool, it comes out of the barrel at 400 feet per second, it hits the water, it goes about two feet into the water at that same speed, and then it just stops and harmlessly drops down to the bottom of the pool. Such is the trajectory of my life. (laughs) I, uh... In, in every area of my life, I come out of the barrel at 400 feet per second. I am smoking toward the target. And then I hit the water. And I trickle harmlessly to the bottom and think, why bother? You know? The water, for me, is fear. 
I have the best intentions of doing, following through with everything I say I'm going to follow through with in relationships, in business, in life. I mean it when I say it. It was like Clancy was talking about last night, except I don't mean to trivialize it, but in that moment, it just brought tears to my eyes to make a vow on your child's life that you will never do that kind of thing before, and then to go back out and do it brings such a... It's a sense that I don't hear in any other... I don't hear it in any other sickness in the, on the planet. Drug addiction, pure drug addiction, any of the other things, it's a sense of remorse. Just that, gr- that crushing remorse that I've failed again, and not only have I failed again, but in that stupid way that we all have, I'm going to redouble my efforts next time. I'm going to do it even better next time. I'm going to really restrict my failure. You know, I'm going to come out of the barrel at 900 feet per second next time. That way, when I hit that water, I'll go about three feet in before I trickle harmlessly to the bottom of the pool. You know, and that's how my life is. In, with and I, I should give you a caveat here. I I read the book, big book. I love the big book. I know the big book. I work all the steps. I do exactly what Scott was saying, and that is, I, I can't get back off on the steps. But I can't quote the big book. I have, I don't know what, it, what, what happened to me when I was drinking, but I've lost all ability to memorize really anything. I love song lyrics. I can remember the ones that I remembered before I started drinking. But some stuff that I, I remembered while, or had experienced while I was drinking, I have a complete lack of memory on it. I, I love poetry. I taught English for years sober. I taught British literature, which is my favorite area, and I cannot recite for you one single piece of poetry from the British uh, Renaissance, which I love, which is a bad, you know, it's sort of, it's t- sad to me in a way, but every time I read it, it seems like something new, which is a good side of it, too. <laughs> but I, um, so when I talk to you tonight, uh, today, uh, what I'm saying is based on what I know in the big book, but I can't quote the pages for you. So if you have a notebook out and you're taking notes, put that away. <laughs> Just be here with me a second while I make a complete jackass out of myself and try to <laughs> grapple through this topic that Bob foist upon me. And um, maybe, maybe some other time I can talk about gratitude. Um, which around my AA group is called the suicide topic. Um, <laughs> So, uh, when I'm afraid of something, I want to control it. But I can't control it because I don't have the huevos to make it happen the way I want to. So I do it in my own passive way. Some of you do have the wherewithal to make it happen and control people. I don't. I'm a type R personality. (laughs) If I put my mind to it, I might be able to control you a little bit, but I really don't give a shit. Um, (laughs) As long as I get what I want out of it, you know? And I'm a coward about inner, inner... Any kind of a confrontation with a person, I can't deal, I can't stand it amends for me have been torture. I mean, like being led down the hall into that big chair, sorry, Tom, uh, in the big chair where they're going to put you in. Uh, I always feel like I'm being led down, you know, with the minister reading next to me if I have to go make an amends to somebody. I do not. It makes me grind inside. And and yet I try to, I try to control things in my own subtle way because I, I, my fear manifests itself through my... Uh, Desire, I suppose, and my uh, and I'm, I'm groping here, really, because I've never given this talk before, because I forgot what I said the last time when I was talking. That Bob assigned this to me, um, but <laughs> I want to control things, but I don't have the power to do so. So I control things by acting like I don't have the power to do so. You know what I mean? By not doing it, I have a sense of control, even though I feel like I'm being a good guy. Example: I would rather. It, it seems much better for me. It, it seems very cruel to me to have a one-night stand with someone and then the next day say, you know, it was nice, but it was a one-night stand. Let's just call it what it is, and uh, I'll see you later. 
sorry if it hurts your feelings. I find it far more humane to extend that into a three-year relationship <laughs> to the point to the point where all you want to do is exchange gunfire with this person in the living room. I find that far more compassionate than to just break it off. Uh, uh, break it off during the post-coital conversation, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but I'm afraid to. So I will extend it until, I, until it's just overwhelmingly uncomfortable. And then I drink. And when I drink, I can rationalize the way I felt. I can play that, I can play that mental... Uh, anticipatory soundtrack that goes on about how it's going to be better next time and once I'm free of all this then I can go somewhere and I can be myself because every time I've been involved with a person when I was drinking and some some and in some part of my sobriety I have been uh, believing that I'm a certain person in front of this person and then I have to be left alone to go be who I am because I have to fake it in front of you in order to make you like me. And if you like me, then I feel like I've gotten what I need out of it. And that's selfishness. That's self-centeredness. That's, that is what I feel is, is probably the root problem that the big book talks about in sexual dealings, which I know is on page 65 or 67 through 69 and thereafter, is that what happens is I objectify another person. And when I objectify another person, I turn them into an object, what I've done is I've taken their humanity away from them and I'm using them for my selfish purposes. And I do that. And I have done that. You know, and I do I try to work that I try to work on it all the time. And I'm not talking about in my current relationship, because I am in another caveat, I'm in a really good relationship right now where I don't have to feel like I have to go someplace else to be me. I am perfectly me around Louise. We have a great time and I am me. And I and uh, at first I'd asked her if she didn't I said, you know, if you don't want to come hear this, you're it's fine. You can go catch a you know, catch the tram over and shop, whatever you want to do. But um but then I thought, you know, this is really important to be honest with people, and, and this is uh, uh, uncomfortable for me, but, you know, it's probably more uncomfortable for you. Um, <laughs> but I objectify people, and objectifying people can happen in sexual, na sexual areas. It happens. That's what makes for racism. That's what makes for sexism. That's what makes for all the isms in the world, and, which is not, it's a defective character to try to assuage my bad self-image and my sick feelings about myself by objectifying you and using you for whatever purposes I need and then convincing myself that I'm not really that way. I'm not really that way. I only did it because I was trying to be helpful. I only did it... Well, no, is, is that not true, though? I mean, I only did it because I'm trying to be helpful. I only did it because it seemed right at the moment. You know, everything seems right at the moment when you're drinking. And, and I always woke up the next day with that sense of terrible remorse and fear, seized with that fear that, oh my God, I might be the person that I hate the most. I might be the person... That, now, that was not a conscious thought because I never said that to myself. I learned that after taking inventories, that I'm not the person that I convinced myself I was. What I was was... Uh, the person I convinced myself what I was was the scaffolding I built around myself to protect that thing that goes on in here that's so shameful and so full of remorse that I can't even touch it. So I put this out here for you and carry that mask around. And for a long time, alcohol filled the gap between what happens inside here and the back of that mask until, so I could make you believe that I am what's, that, what's on that mask. This is really me. And then as anybody in AA knows, the alcohol stops filling the gap over a period of time until pretty soon, on the 11th of June of 1981, I was holding that mask out there for everything I had. I mean, everything I had. And there was nothing between the back of that mask and right in here. And I was as drunk as I've ever been in my life. And it just didn't fill the gap anymore. Oh, I could get a few moments of anticipation. I can get a few moments of that, that sense of being present for a moment, you know, and alcohol giving me a sense of control. But I, was, I couldn't get the power from alcohol that I got before. And I think that's probably the most terrifying thing for an alcoholic is to find out that you can't get... It's like starting your car and it, won't, and it doesn't turn over when you've got to get somewhere. 
There's that sense of, oh my God, I don't know what to do now. And the same thing happened to me that day. I, I went back to alcohol to try to find the power again, and the power wasn't there anymore. Because I couldn't, for some reason, and Chuck Chamberlain used to say this, that he said, and I didn't understand it when I heard him say it, he said everything between me and me was gone. And I didn't, I didn't get that when I was new. I didn't get it till years after I heard him say it. But I realized then that everything between what I thought I was and what I really was was gone. And, I, and now, what are you left with? You're left with what Clancy talked about last night. You're left, and my sponsor described this to me, as raw information just being shot at you like a, like a, the team of error, you know, uh, the team of, of uh, what do they call those guys? Archers. Archers in Braveheart. They're coming over, here comes all the arrows, and you're standing there naked, you know. Which part do you want to bend over to sacrifice first, you know, because you've got to do something. And that's how I felt when I was sober. I was starting to get all this raw information, and it made me want to drink because I always thought that's, that's, that's my shield is to get, once I get a couple of drinks in me, I can fight off all that raw information about myself, all that fear I can fight back, all, that, that, uh, all those lies, all that stuff. I can, I, can get it, I can scramble it and get the paint on that condemned house one more time you know, so people will believe that what I put out there really is me. And it didn't work, and I knew I couldn't drink anymore. I don't know why. It wasn't a conscious thought. I just knew that if I, I can't start drinking anymore. And I, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous just full of the same habits and full of the same desires and full of the same defects of character, except completely pounded into the ground. I started coming to the Pacific Group when I was 60 days sober, and I was, ter- you know, when I got to AA, I was as scared of AA as I was of people anyway, because I do not, I used to believe, and this is, this is something I've always talked about, is that I just don't like the human race. Not you, but them. <laughs> them and their little lives, on their, in their little cars, or their little families, you know, driving by as you're sitting in the bar and someone happens to open the door on Sunday morning and that shaft of light comes through like an axe blade right through the middle of the bar and everybody turns as if on one axis and yells, shut the goddamn door, you know? And as the door is, is, is hissing, you know, because they always have that thing, those things that go, so it, it, it closes really slowly to lock in the vapor and anxiety in the bar. But as it's closing... I could see people going by on, on uh, Lincoln Boulevard in, in Anaheim, driving by in their little cars with their little families, going to their little church to be little, little God's people, <laughs> to worship a God who doesn't even care about them, who doesn't care about anybody. They don't even get it. They're so stupid. They're just cattle. They're wretched little people that, you know, from amen to the parking lot, it turns into the seething mass of humanity. You know, I knew that from being in a Catholic church. We'd go from the Lord be with you and also with you to that son of a bitch better get out of my way. You know, my dad would be up out there, you know. He wasn't even Catholic. He was Methodist, but, so he could say it. My mother would, would because my mother never swore in her life. Uh, and I would just sit there bewildered, you know. And, uh, but people are are terrible and I don't want to be around them. They are awful. Reality of the situation, I'm afraid of people because I'm afraid I don't measure up to people. Because I know, I know before I even start that I don't measure up. And the longer the conversation goes on between you and me, the more over the years I've tried to affect the smile that says that this conversation's over. Because I can't tell you what I'm thinking that why don't you stop talking? I'm not interested. I've got to go have a few drinks and think about real things. Because if you were like me, you, have, you would have the big picture. But you live in an idiot's world. I'm in here in the humdinger in Anaheim with the astronauts and surgeons and all those other people, and we have the big picture. We know how to treat our women. We know how to live our lives, and nobody's afraid in here. You know, this is a safe place for people like me. I never spoke to another soul in the humdinger. Never talked to anybody in there. Just sat there and drank. But felt connected to everybody because we all knew, we all understood that we were doing something better in there than all those chumps 
that were out there doing, you know, going to God, God's chosen people. I knew there wasn't. I believed in God. I'm like Clancy. I believed in God completely when I was a child. And, and as, a, as a man walking into AA when I was 30 years old, I believed in God, but I didn't believe that God had any interest in me. I thought if I just kind of ducked around a while, he'd forget about me. You know, and I was sure he'd forgotten about me like everybody else had. And I was a victim. You know, but I, I thought God was busy with all the people you know, up in the penthouse of life. All the good church-going people that keep their gloves in their glove box in their car. You know, those people. Really focused people. People who don't who, you know, people who actually sleep in their bed rather than sleep under a dish towel next to the bed because it's easier than trying to get into the bed. I make do. I'm resourceful. I live my life, you know. If I wanted to get in that bed, I would, but I just choose to lay here on the floor under a dish towel. You got a problem with that? You know. People would say, why do you sleep under a dish towel? And I'd say, it's in any of your damn business why I sleep under a dish towel. I know why I sleep under there. I know it's comfortable and I know it's enough. But I never said that to you. I just said, I don't know. Uh, that's how my whole life was. People would ask me things. I'd say, you know, I don't know. When inside, I'm, I'm, the fear's got me. and I'm thinking the only way I can get around this person would be to have them assassinated. I always wish them dead. I had kids, there were kids in my neighborhood that I just hated when I was a kid and was thinking, you know, all my, they came out in my inventory. I hated these kids because I knew they all understood each other better than I understood anybody and I was never a part of it. And I hated them. And I used to fantasize when I was a kid. Every time we'd drive up to Bakersfield, my parents would drive me up to Bakersfield. It was like, you know, again, going down the long hallway to the chair because we were going to go up and visit our family. And they were all huggy and kissy and, you know, they are all from Fargo. And, um, <laughs> and they never would say Fargo. They'd go, Fargo, Moorhead, make a decision. Are you in Fargo or Moorhead? I don't say Anaheim Garden Grove. Uh, I, you know, Anaheim Fullerton. Make a decision. I know there's a Red River there, but just pick a side. And I, um, but all my family was from Fargo, and they were they were affectionate, loving. They cared about me, but I never understood that while I was in them. I only understood that after I got after I disengaged all of them, and my life started. You know, I, I was a man who had no ability to, to look at the future with any with any sense of comfort and I was a person when I turned and looked over my shoulder was full of remorse and shame and guilt over the stuff that not only that fear had that I had done in reaction to fear but all the things that I had chosen not to do because I was afraid to do them like try to be something try to be I always wanted to be a writer not that's not a big deal to anybody in or where I am but it's just an example to you everybody in this room I believe and I, I think most people will concur that everybody, every single person sitting in this room, as well as every person in this casino and every person in this state, in this country and in this world, has been imbued with the seed of something that they do uniquely well. And they do it according to the gift that God has given them for doing it. It doesn't matter what that is. It's not for me to judge what their gift is. It's for me to <clears throat> try to use my own gifts. And I've always had a little inkling that maybe I'm supposed to be a writer. I wrote a story about a bear in the third grade, and that the teacher gave me an A, and I thought, that's what I want to do. It was the lazy guys out, because it was obvious I wasn't going to get through, uh, get by on construction, or because uh, my dad was a carpenter, and I used to stand in the garage and watch him and go, no way would I ever be able to cut, you know, on a miter, you know, and do all these wonderful things that my father could do. He worked magic in the garage, but I had, I had complete indifference toward him because he was not a success like I had believed that a success was, and, and he was just a chump, you know. He'd squish around in his, in his squishy-soled shoes with the sawdust all over his glasses, and I thought, that's not the person I want to be. I want to do great things. I want to be a writer, you know. I'm going to be... I never made the jump between wanting to be a writer and actually having written something. Uh, that's quite a chasm to leap over, but I did buy corduroys and, uh, uh, and got, a, got a tweed jacket at the St. Martin's Thrift Store in Venice, or down Santa Monica, and I was, I was going to be a writer. And I'd bring my notebook to the humdinger, you know, and notebook to the ore house in Santa Monica, and write, and, you know, the tip of the pen, and thoughtfully write things, you know, hoping that she would come in. And, and it, you know how it goes. 
I'm writing crap. I'm writing nothing. I am a nothing. Then the next day I go to my job. I had a job in publishing. I was working as a, a receiving clerk in a bookstore, and I was out there unloading trucks and um, <laughs> doing the writerly thing, a uh, writer in training, and, and, uh, and, and resenting all other writers. I would go to a bookstore and look at people's books, and the minute I would open a book, I'd go right to that back flap and look and see how old they were and go, that son of a bitch had it. He lives in Westchester, New York. Oh, he, he, he grew up in a literary family. His father wasn't a carpenter. His mother wasn't a housewife. His dad didn't have a third grade education, you know. I'll be that later. And I'll tell you something. I had opportunities thrown in my lap to be a writer. I had people walk up and say, we'd like to hire you for something. Would you write something? Sure. I would get the assignment. I would go home. I would sit in my house, and I would start drinking. And then seven months later, I would call them back and say, I think I have an idea. And they would say, that's great, but we already hired the people to do that, but thanks for calling back. And then I would go into anger and resentment about them and their stupid beliefs in what is good when I'm good. You just don't recognize it yet, and you don't even give a guy like me a chance, you know. And it was all fear. I couldn't get going because I was terrified. I don't know why. I think if I could go to therapy, I might learn why, but what good would that be? Therapy is good for that, I, and I'm not a therapy basher either at all. I think therapy is good for people, but I think that it doesn't work for alcoholism. And I, uh, you know, I could go and find out what all the root cores of my fears are, but it, I think it's much more helpful, and it has been for me, to sit down with another sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and have them put their hand against the small of my back in that figurative way that we do and say, why don't you just try it? You know, there's a, there's a, 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 I don't know what kind of physics law it is, but if you're walking up a steep hill, really steep hill, it's a hard pull to get up a steep hill. But if you're walking with another person, if you put your hand in the small of their back, it, you don't even have to push. You just put your hand to support the small of their back, and you can go up the hill really fast without any effort at all with someone else's hand there. And I think that's what a sponsor has done for me. I came in here, you know, again, I didn't get a sponsor for a long time. I got, uh, I finally got one. Um, he was really nice to me up until I asked him to be my sponsor. <laughs> and then he kind of just turned on me, and, uh, and he told me I had to go, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm in AA by the skin of my teeth. I don't want to be here. I'm not completely convinced that I'm an alcoholic, even though I'm flipping away imaginary gnats in my peripheral vision and, and, and wearing sunglasses to nighttime meetings, you know, uh, with a deerstalker hat and, and shoulder-length hair and, and just, you know... Uh, looking a little spooky. And, um, <laughs> then, they, then Bill said, uh, you, I want you to go to Clancy's yard on Saturdays. To do what? <laughs> well, you're going to play softball there and then play volleyball. I've got to tell you something. I lived, I lived a block away from Clancy for 13 years. It was a two-minute walk to his house to the yard. I was t I, every morning I woke up on Saturday morning, my feet would hit the floor, and the first thing I would say is, shit, <laughs> it's Saturday morning, and I've got to go to the yard. <laughs> and I, I didn't live right near, I, the first time I went to the yard, I was living in Anaheim, and I, I slept in that morning, and I went to the yard about 10 o'clock. And it started at 9.15, and, and uh, I didn't know who Clancy was. I'd never met him before, and I, was, uh, I came there, and I asked some guys, uh, I'm here, how do I get to do what everybody else is doing? Like, I really want to do it. And uh, I knew I'd have to report back to Bill. And so the guy, one of the guys put his arm around my shoulder, and he goes, you see that guy with the glasses out there on the pitcher's mound barking at orders at everybody around there? Go up to him and tell him you had to sleep in this morning and ask him if he can give you a, uh, get you on a game. So I... Excuse me, sir. <laughs> what? <laughs> I had to sleep in this morning, and I just got here, and this is my first time at the yard, and, and I don't know what to do. He completely changed. Oh, come here, kid. Just go over to that diamond over there and tell the guy that you want to be on the team, and, and they'll put you on the team. Go ahead. He knew instinctively that I was terrified, and so he didn't go after me as if I was someone who just had purposely slept in, and, but I didn't get the blast that I... That I after knowing Clancy for 25 years, I would anticipate now. But, 
but there was, and, and I heard him call somebody a puke. I had never heard anybody call someone a puke except my father. My father was a World War II vet, and anybody who was in my generation was a miserable little puke. And he watched, you know, we, I remember watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan with him. My dad go, look at those pukes, you know. <laughs> and so when Clancy called somebody a puke, I thought, I don't know why, but I feel I'm gonna, like I'm comfortable for some reason. <laughs> But I was, I wanted, uh, the point of the story is that I was terrified the entire time I was doing this. I'd get to the yard and they, you know, and I got to be a poop scooper. Yep, there was a lot of, there was a pony at the time who ate a lot and, uh, and made a lot of deposits in that bank. And I, uh, I was a poop scooper and then I got to be a wheel barrel man you know I never got to be a pointer I never quite had that because they have a pointer that goes around and points with a stick is where the where the where the deposits are and uh and we clean up and we clean up the yard because uh, because we're going to play in the yard people say how come you have to clean up Clancy's yard well if you want to be having a picnic lunch later in the day you want to be sure you got that place spick and span before you get going you know but uh, I would do that because, and I didn't do it because I wanted to, and I didn't do it because I loved the smell of horse and dog turds in the morning. I did it because it kept my mind off the fact that I was afraid to be there. I was terrified to be there. And I also did it because the, 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 uh, my self-worth was so shot that when they said, when Clancy said that the poo scoopers get coffee first and get to get in the front of the line, it made me feel better about something. That's where I got my first taste of self-worth, was shoveling poop in a backyard of some guy I didn't even know. And yet, because I did that, I got to get in the front of the line. And for some unknown reason, there, was moment, there were moments of grace that were sneaking in there because what I had done is I had surrendered my will to a power greater than I was. And it wasn't Clancy, and it wasn't the, the, you know, the wheelbarrow guy. It was something that I didn't understand. And I had come into to AA with a God of my expectations, not a God of my understanding. I had a God that, like, like Scott, I wanted to negotiate with him. If I do this, I would hope, as a creature of reason, that you, likewise, would do this. And, and I've, I've, gone, I've gone to meetings where people parse the big book in that way. You know, now, if you, if you tell God to do this, you're going to force his hand, see? And then you'll be a higher level AA than other <laughs> AA people. And... Um, <laughs> I've been to meetings where we're there, you know, people try to you know, throw the chicken bones and feathers down and woogie 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 and try to channel Dr. Bob and Bill. You know? <laughs> um, the only thing I have found that works on fear is surrender. And that sounds like it's against every principle I've ever known is to surrender to fear and yet it's the only thing that has ever worked for me because and I'm going to use the yard I went to the yard for three years I was there every Saturday and, I, and if you stay long enough if you because I was at the stage where we would we would pick teams by, by who had the most sobriety well I was there arguing with guys well, I got sober June 11th so, so did I well I got sober at 10 a.m. and I was oh, I was noon go ahead and get in front of me you know uh and there was that kind of negotiating. But after a while, a lot of people drop out, not because AA doesn't work, but because the disease of alcoholism is, like every speaker you're going to hear this weekend, a terrible, terrible, powerful thing. But I was so scared that I just kept going to this yard and doing what people said, and I wound up becoming a catcher in the game, which was terrifying. I mean, the worst, because we had guys that were, were throwing softball. They played softball at Folsom Prison <laughs> at San Quentin. There was a guy named Marv R. who was about 300 pounds, and he had an arm like a catapult. And he would he'd say, "Okay, baby, get back there behind the pay. You just hold your glove up in the you just hold your glove up in the strike zone, and I'll put it to you." And I thought, "You smug bastard!" I got okay. I'd hold my glove up, and he'd go like that. I'd go, and then he'd move it over and move it over, you know, and he'd go. And then he'd stand back and he'd look at me. His arm would come back like, it would go like this, and that's all I would see. And all of a sudden, it would be, wham, in the glove. <laughs> I've got the ball in the glove. Take the glove off, put my hand under my arm, and climb out. 
I go out to Marv and say, Marv, when you're going to send him in that fast, just give me a little signal, okay? He goes, oh, baby, they're all coming in that fast. <laughs> oh, jeez. And the whole game, I was just peeing my pants back there. I'd look at Marv. He'd give me the move. i just, oh, no. Wow! In the glove. And, uh... I would leave that yard at 3 o'clock after playing a game of volleyball and further humiliating myself. And I'd leave there feeling like a million bucks. I'd leave there not feeling like an athlete, but feeling like a man amongst people that I was afraid of that were kind to me there, even though I didn't know what I was doing. And I got through the fear by putting myself in the middle of the things that I was afraid of. And the same thing happened in relationships, you know. We're the only group of people who can be dying of alcoholism and then we get a whiff of recovery for six weeks and decide we need a relationship. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden I'm primed. I don't know why, I just all of a sudden feel better and now I'm ready to move up to that next level. I got involved with a woman at three months sober. She had four months. And um, we started doing the things that you know, because it was fear. I, I was getting a divorce at the time, and I, I was insecure, and I just fought, that's my fallback position, is to try, you know, and she, she and I started hanging out together, and we wound up, I started doing the things that we do. I started ditching going out for coffee after the meeting. I started hanging out with her and getting to the meeting right up before it would start. I started um, not going to the group things because we were going to go do something else. And this went on for about six or eight weeks. And, uh, and eventually she, uh, what happens... What happened with her was that she was a month ahead of me, and she started to change a month before I did. And she took a look at me one day and went, Ew. <laughs> I'm not in this anymore. I can't deal with this anymore. And it, you talk about a tailspin and grass stains on your head. I went into such a, I collapsed. I was a mess, a wreck. I went, and it's just, it's too tawdry a description of the story, but a further story, but I called Bill, and I said, she just, she split up with me, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, he said, oh, now you're getting it. You know, why don't you just come to the meeting tonight? And I was going to drink that night, but I had told a guy named Luis M., who's still sober in my class, I told him he, I told him I would stack chairs for him that night. And I didn't want him to be mad at me. So I went to stack the chairs, you know, and, I, and that saved my life. That commitment saved my life. Something stupid like that because I did something through the fear that I, I had come to believe would make me feel better. And all this stuff has come out in an inventory. All these, stuff is, these things have come out in inventory after inventory after inventory where I could see a pattern happening in my sense of relationships with women, relationships with other people, and the sense of fear that always was the water that I would strike and, and just fall into and, and become... It would just be over for me. And then I would have to drink to get back in the chamber again. You know, once I drank that bullet's back in the chamber and I'm ready to go... You know, and I would just assume you not, just cock the gun and just rub your finger on the trigger. <laughs> Don't pull the trigger, because that's where alcohol took me, is just that sense that I am coming out of the barrel at 400 feet per second pretty soon. You know, And the minute something started to happen where I would start to get some success or start to be able to do something, pink into the water, down. And that sense of remorse and guilt and shame and embarrassment and powerlessness. And I have to try to go do it again. And um, what's happened over the years is that, you know, I'm still friends with that woman. That lady that I was involved with when I was newly sober is, uh, is now 25 years sober, living in New York and has a family and has been going to AA ever since. And, and thank God that she discovered what she had to discover before, you know, a month before I did. But um, I've never had a... a thing happened to me in AA that wasn't good. And what I've learned is that I can I can do the steps without having to do them perfectly like Scott was talking about. I do the steps much like I give AA talks. I'm, I stumble and mumble and do them haltingly and uncomfortably and with absolutely no polish whatsoever. 
But I do them. All you have to do is do it. It doesn't matter. I mean, Vince Wise says you've got to look bad before you can feel good. And, and that's helped me because my sponsor has always been there. I have people in this room. I mean, I, I went through, um, I'll jump ahead a little bit. Um, I stayed single for 17 years in sobriety. Um, I made amends to my first wife. Uh, I had several relationships with people in, in sobriety, that I, women that I really cared about. And, and, and we were able to end those relationships without any drama. It was just a discussion and an honest respectful thing because what happened was I hadn't I'd been learning to not make objects out of people that I desired as a way of satisfying something in me I was tapped in because of the program into a power that I could turn to my sponsor to a power that I could pray to to a power that even though I despised people for a long time I uh, when I was a, about a year so eight months sober, and I say this whenever I talk because it's important for me to remember this. I came in here just despising people, and my sponsor said, go around the room before the meeting and shake people's hands and ask them their name. Ask them their name and ask them how their day was. Get, get ten men's phone numbers. Men's phone numbers. Uh, get a commitment at every meeting you go to. Go out for coffee after the meeting. Go around and shake hands again. I go, hey, shake hands again. I just shook hands. I didn't say that. I said, okay. And, um, <laughs> and do that again and ask them their name. And I told him, I don't care. You know, honestly, I don't care about their name and I don't care. He said, that's all right. You don't have to care. Just do it. Because they don't care about you either if you feel that way. Just go ahead and do it. Everybody just, you know, just do it. He wasn't going to explain any direction to me. He told me that from the start. So I did that. I went around and shook hands. Hi, I'm Charlie. You know, a straight arm, because I don't want you to get too close that you're going to be trying to pull in for a hug, you know. <laughs> and eventually my arm started to bend a little bit, and I started to shake people's hands and ask them their name and talk to them and look them in the eye, you know, which was a change for me. When I, and, and when I was eight months, and I'd been telling Bill for, for months, I'd said, you know, the program's not working for me. It's not working. Said, what do you mean it's not working? I haven't had a spiritual awakening yet. I'm still terrified of this stuff. I haven't had any kind of a spirit. He's, what are you talking? What? I said, well, I got to do that. We got to start the steps. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm eight months sober and we haven't done the steps yet. He goes, what steps do you mean? And he said, well, the first. I said, the first three would be a start. And he said, you're going to meetings every day, right? Yeah. And you're shaking everybody's hand and you're thanking the people when they participate, right? Yeah. And you got commitments at your meetings, right? Yeah. And you don't always want to go to those meetings, do you? And I said, God, no. And he goes, but you go anyway, don't you? And I said, yeah. He says, how do you feel when you leave? And I said, better. You call me every day, right? Yeah. And you pray, because I make you, he made me, for the first week that he had me as a sponsor, he would wait on the phone while I got on my knees and prayed. He'd make me put the phone down on the bed and get on my knees and pray, and then go back, okay, I'm done. And uh, he'd say, good, okay, go to your meeting. So he says, you're calling me every day and you're praying every day, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, what part of the first three steps do you think you're not doing? They're not theory. They're stuff that you do. They, you incorporate these threads into your life. And eventually they become, they will, they will uh, the big book talks about fear being a thread that runs through our lives and, and, and eventually corrupts all the fiber in our lives. Well, the same thing is true with commitment and hope. And he said, well, even though you don't, feel it you have hope and you're doing the steps but it's not theoretical we don't sit around and talk about all the colorations of the steps you just go out and do them and you come back to aa and report what you found in a hopeful way after you brought your problems to me just go to the meetings and for, don't worry about this let me worry about it for you because i wanted a big spiritual awakening i don't want one of those little silent voices in the night. I want a big old knock down who's your daddy kind of spiritual awakening. I don't know. And um, at eight months sober, I'm in line. Uh, I, I'm actually at eight months sober. I'm mopping the floor at Ohio Street, which is where we have some of our meetings. I'm mopping the floor with these other two losers who are still sober. And uh, I paused for a moment uh, and was taking a breather for a second. I was looking at the people who were lined up to thank the speaker. There were about 125, 130 people standing there. And my eye went across every face that was standing in that line. And without, even, without thinking it, it occurred right inside here that 
I knew every single one of those people by their name, and I liked them. How does that happen to a guy who is convinced that he doesn't like people, who doesn't like humanity, who is put off by every kind of social interaction as an oppressive kind of forced communication that I don't want to be involved in, to stand there and have it occur to me, I know all these people by their first name, and I like every single one of them. I like them. Where does that come from? That comes from surrendering to a power that I believe, and this is my opinion, is inside of me. It doesn't live out here anywhere. It lives inside of me, just as it lives inside of everybody else around here, in AA and out of AA. And if I am able to acknowledge that power that is in me through you, I can be helped by your power, which is why I come back to the fellowship, because the fellowship has taught me how to get through my fears in all areas of my life. So that now I can try to be, on a daily basis, an honest, respectable, and respectful man. Because I want to be a man. I don't want to be an old boy. And I know women, women like men. They don't like old boys. You know? And I, uh, and to be a man, I have to follow the examples of responsible men. I don't make it up on my own. I watch people. I learned how to make amends to my mother by listening to Sharon. I learned how to make amends to my dead father by listening to Clint. These people gave me pieces of my life back. How do you ever thank somebody for that? There's no way except to just keep coming back and doing what you're doing because there's no way you can repay that. But I learned from their experience, and I know that Sharon was not comfortable in doing what she did, and I know Clint was not comfortable in doing what he did. But I know they walked through it, and I tried to mimic them exactly as they did it because I knew I had to get through the fear of trying to make amends to my dad. I'd waited 10 years to make amends to my father. He'd been dead for 20 years at that point. But I did it, and you know what? I'm fine. I got the same response. I got the same, re- the same payback that I surrendered myself to the fear and was able to go through with the action and found something I totally un- was totally unexpected. And the total unexpected nature of what happens to me in sober life is what keeps me coming back. I got married. I fell in love. I got married. I had two beautiful children. I still have them. Uh, my, my son is seven and a half and my daughter is six, almost six. And I am completely taken with these kids. I cut their umbilical cords, and I have never, I've never done anything except gain love for them as, as the days go on. And, uh, and my, my wife at the time and I had a terrible, bitter divorce, and I'm not going to go into any discussion of it because you may run into her sometime at an AA meeting. I hope you do. And I hope that, that anything I would say would not be used against her uh, in here and that, that people would be able to give her the fair shake that, that I've gotten in here. And, uh, and we ha- I had my part in that, certainly. And I've, I've done my, tried to do my inventory on that and get it cleared out. And, and uh, my children are my life. And I, I learned to get through the fear of being a divorced dad because I'd never been in a divorced family, so I didn't know what it was all about. And guys, there were men in my group who were divorced fathers who came through and taught me how to, how to call my kids before they go to bed every night and wish them a uh, good night and tell them I love them. And to, uh, as Clancy taught me years ago, but people, the single dads reminded me, the, the divorced dads reminded me that uh, show up on time when you say you're going to be there to get them. Never change your plans at the last minute so that you don't go follow through with what you have to do with them. So I don't take any AA commitments on the days that I have my children because I'm inflexible in that area. I, I'm with my children on those days. I'm not going to have them as little kids for a long time. And I want to be with them and I want to have, with the time I have with them, I want to be with them. Then uh, um, my, uh, here's another, I'll give you another fear story and I'll I'll be finished, I guess. Um, About two, about two years ago, I got invited to speak at a conference in Turks and Caicos Island in the Caribbean. And I, I'm kind of, you know, again, I keep my clothes on for your benefit. Um, (laughs) I'm not going to go out there in a, you know, in a, in a gym, you know, go out there and, hey, baby, you know, uh, and, and have people have to shield their eyes from the glare. But I, um, but I went there, and, and uh, I was having a good time. And, and my friend Louise, who I've known for, you know, 15 years, 13 years uh, in my group, was there, and she'd been divorced from her husband for about a year and a half. And I, was get, I was, had been divorced from my wife for about a year. And she was on the trip, and I'd never really talked to Louise that much. And we sort of hit it off there, and... Uh, 
the the summer before that, I, I, my kids were getting an interest in, in the pool. Now, I, I took swimming lessons from an Olympic gold medal winner named Sammy Lee back in the 1950s and never went into a pool after that because... Uh, <laughs> Because for some reason, I am terrified to put my head underwater. There are a few things in life that terrify me more than having my head underwater. I don't know where that came from. I have my guesses, but I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. I just couldn't do it. Well, my children have no fear of water, you know. Uh, they were learning to swim. My daughter got in the pool with me one day at the public pool, and she's, holding, she's standing there, and she's, she says, uh, Hey, let's put our face in the water. <laughs> I said, uh, Go ahead. <laughs> And she said, she said, no, let's, you do it. And I go, Daddy doesn't do that. And she said, I'll hold your hand. And I said, oh, all right. <laughs> I held that little five-year-old's hands. She's looking at me, and I, I dip my face in the water and pulled it up really fast. And she's smiling, you know, and she said, you did it. And I said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> Let me, go just some, let me go somewhere and be by myself for a second. I, uh... <laughs> so, so over the year, you know, I knew I was dreading summer coming. Oh, I was dreading summer. My son is like a frog in the pool. He, see, it's at, at, he taught himself to ride a two-wheeled bike at age four. He, jumped, he was swimming in a pool at age five like a frog, just swimming. And I'm thinking, oh, no, you know, he's going to ask me to go swimming with him someday. I'm going to have to avoid the pool. I'm going to have to find a whole list of reasons why I don't have to go in the pool. So I go to Turks and Caicos Island. Well, not only do they have a pool, but they have an ocean, too, there. <laughs> and a friend of mine named Annie was there. And Annie said, uh, how come you don't go in the pool? And I said, ah, I'm just not crazy about swimming. And she said, you, you can't swim, can you? I said, no, I took swimming lessons. And she said, you can't swim. Are you afraid to go on the water? I said, yeah, I am actually. I don't know how to swim. I'm afraid to go. What are you going to do when your kids want to go in the pool this summer? I don't know. I'm going to have to figure something out. She said, would you like to learn to swim? And I said, you know, I can't learn to swim. I, I tried learning to swim. I took lessons when I was a kid. She said, why don't you meet me here at the pool at 3 o'clock this afternoon, and I'll uh, give you a lesson. Okay. I'll be there. Well, again, down the long hallway to the chair. Um, <laughs> go to the pool. There's Annie in her bathing suit. Takes me by the hand. She says, walk up next to the pool. We get up to the edge of the pool, and she says, let's say a prayer. Let's ask God to be here and be with us. Let's don't be afraid of this. Let's, just, let's, let's ask God to be here and to do whatever he's going to do. And then she just jumped in the pool. We just both went into the pool. That scared the crap out of me. She just said, here we go. And she jumped in. And luckily, the pool only came up to about here. So I'm, you know. And, uh, and she, little by little, she gave me a lesson for about an hour that day. Of, let, there are going to be two things you're going to have to know how to do. One is called Marco Polo. And one is called Tea Party. Let's practice the Tea Party. I said, what's a Tea Party? She said, that's where you sit cross-legged on the bottom of the pool. I said, no way. Am I going to sit cross-legged? You mean with the water over my head? And she said, yeah. So she made me do it. You know, I put goggles on. I went under and did it. And so she said, I got out of that pool after about an hour and thought, well, okay. That's... And she said, okay, I'll see you here tomorrow morning at 11. You know, I got a whole week of this going ahead of me. This is Monday. So the next morning at 11, I'm out at the pool, you know, and, well, actually that night at dinner at, at this island, I, I see Annie and she pulls me over and goes, 11 o'clock, she was talking to another woman, 11 o'clock tomorrow. And the other woman says, what's happening at 11 o'clock? And Annie says, I'm teaching Charlie how to swim. And she goes, oh, you know what? I teach adults how to swim in Colorado. Her name is Laura Kay and she lives in Colorado. And she said, I teach adults how to swim. That's part of my, that's what I do for a living. And Annie turned to me and said, that's God showing off. Uh, <laughs> Laura said, do you mind if I meet you at the pool at 11? No, more the merrier. So now I get to share my humiliation with two women. 
meanwhile, I'm talking to Louise every morning at breakfast going, I don't know how I'm doing this. I can't, I can't get in the pool. But you know what? I did it every day. I showed up twice a day, 11 and 3, every single day. And they taught me, you know, Laura put her hand on my belly and helped me get across the pool. I learned how to backstroke. I learned how to, how to dog paddle and put my face in the water until by the end of the week I could actually stay underwater and not panic and not be frozen in terror because I had two AA members who understood what fear is about, who understood how to get through fear and what people... And they also, more importantly, they understood what is at stake for people like me when it comes to fear. And that is I will either walk through the fear or I will drink. Because I can't, how, many, how long can I make excuses with my children and feel like an abject failure with them? Or do I go through the discomfort and the fear of trying to learn to do something that I can share with my children and enjoy that? So the following summer, I got in the pool with my kids. They wanted to go to the pool, and Daddy swam in the water with my son. I dog paddled through the water, and I got there with my daughter. And, she, and my daughter was the same exact spot we were the year before. She goes, okay, let's put our faces under the water and look at each other. And I said, okay, let's do it. She goes, on your mark, Daddy, on your set, Dad, you know, and go. And we both put our heads under the water and looked at each other and popped back up. And she's beaming. And I said, I learned to swim in February. I, I learned to do that this year. And she goes, I know, I taught you. <laughs> Let me give you this as a parting shot, and I'll sit down because I've gone over my time. But uh, I um, uh, learned how to ski in Vail, Colorado with an ex-girlfriend. Oh, and Louise and I snuck up on each other that week, and we've been dating ever since. And I've been so delighted because, you know what? If I thought, if I'd been able to see the future and see that I was going to be with Louise, I would have screwed it all up trying to make it happen, you know, in my own selfish interest. And what happened was she snuck up on me with her goodness. And her, and her loveliness, and, and I wound up, we wound up just staying together, you know, and we've developed a really good relationship. So there's hope for those of you who are terrified of this. And for those of you who have problems in that area, this is good. This is the best thing I've ever had. And, and um, so I went, to, I went with, with a previous girlfriend. I went to Vail, Colorado with her and her family one, one Christmas, and uh, she, was gonna, she said, well, you'll have to learn how to ski. I thought, okay. So we, she said, you're going to have to take lessons. And I hate lessons of any kind. I just want to do it. I want to get on the slopes, shoot down, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then do that. <laughs> what happened was I had to meet everybody on the bunny hill in the morning. <laughs> the first lesson, I, I'm in all this equipment walking like this and the first lesson no lie is how to get up after a fall this is not an optimistic way to begin learning anything <laughs> this is like learning how to drive in your first lesson being how to stay out of the ways of the jaws of life you know when they're cutting the door off of the car so so we're on the bunny hill and then we go out on this other hill in the in the late morning and i'm i go down the hill okay come on down the hill charlie I go down the hill, boom, I'm going this way. I turn, I go around this way, make my first turn, and then I slip and fall. <sighs> you know, it takes me 10 minutes to get up, start going back, swim, make my first turn, make my second turn, slip and fall again. Well, I did this about 20 times. The whole class is waiting. So I get to the lodge at lunchtime, which is where I was supposed to meet Maria, She's a black diamond skier. She goes down to those, you know, like the devil's rectum runs. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm sitting in the lounge. I'm soaked. I'm, I'm soaked and sweating at the same time and freezing. And she walks in with Hans or Otto or one of these guys, you know. We were out in the back bowls being dropped out of a helicopter onto the slope. Uh, how was your morning on the bunny hill? I said, I keep falling. I had a lousy time. I keep falling down. She goes, you keep falling down? Why? And I said, I don't know. I just keep falling down. She said, well, let me go out with you afterward and, and uh, uh, after lunch and let's see what you're doing. So she, said, she was a good teacher and very compassionate. She's an al uh, She said, just go up to the top. No, I'm not making that as a joke. al are the only people who like us. Uh, she, uh, she goes up to the top of the hill. 
or I go up to the top of the hill, she goes to the bottom of the hill, and she goes, okay, ski down, and I'll watch what you're doing. So I go, okay, watch this. I start to ski. I make my first turn. Come around, make my second turn. Halfway around into my third turn, I slip and fall. She goes, come on, do it again. I get up and do it again. First turn, second turn, third, just into the third turn, slip, pow, back on my bottom again. Yeah, I'm just furious. She comes walking up the hill. She says, I think I see what's wrong. I said, what's going on? She says, you're sitting down. I'm not sitting down. I'm falling down. I wouldn't sit down. How stupid is that? I want to go down the hill. She said, no, it's, you don't even know you're doing it. What you're doing is you're getting around the second turn. You're going faster, and you start to get a little bit afraid, and you lean back toward the hill, which is a perfectly human instinctive reaction is to go back toward the hill rather than go that way. You lean back to the hill, and you sit down for your own safety. And it's purely instinctive. You don't even know you're doing it. I said, well, what do you suspect that I should do in that instance? And she goes, well, when you feel like you're you're scared and you're going to fall down, bend your knees and lean forward. I thought, oh, that's good, you know. (laughs) I'm going into a skid. What do I do? Floor it, you know. (laughs) So... I told her, she, that, that's, I can't do that. She said, well, then you're on your own. I'm going to go. She went off with Otto to, you know, ch- chase elk somewhere. I don't know. But she, um, <laughs> the next day, we go skiing with her whole family. So we go to the top of the hill. And uh, the, I mean the top. I mean past the dew line, back where there's no vegetation at the top of this mountain, way up at the top. And we're getting ready to go. And all of a sudden, the snow plows start coming over the hill. And they said, well, we're not going to wait for the snow plows. Let's go. And they all took off. All of them, shoot, like a pack. And I'm standing there, oh, Jesus, you know, and I'm, I've got this, the, and, and little kids are going by, pew, 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 down the hill. And I thought, well, I'm not going to get behind the snowplow. So I took off, and I'm going. I get down, make my first turn, come around, make my second turn. Just so I get the third turn, I start to panic. And I, it came to my head what Maria said, bend your knees and lean forward. I bent my knees, I leaned down the hill. Shoom, came on my, stayed on my feet, went around, bent my knees and leaned forward, came back around again, bent my knees and leaned forward, came back around again, and then I ate it big time. I mean, <laughs> I hit that ground, my skis went this way, my hat came off, my glasses, you know, uh, some guy skied by and yelled, yard sale, as I went by. Uh, and... I'm laying there in the snow. I'm sputtering because I got snow up my nose. I got snow in my mouth. I'm spitting and blowing snow out. And Maria, Maria, I look and Maria's coming up the hill. She said, we were all standing at the bottom of the hill. You fell. You really fell. You were bending your knees and leaning forward, weren't you? And I said, yeah, I was. Now, those of you who are struggling with something in here, I'm sure that's very inspiring for you. I want to tell you something. There is a lesson in that, and that is whatever you're afraid of, whatever you're afraid is going to take you down, go against what your insides tell you and your alcoholism tells you. Do what we're doing. Bend your knees. Lean forward into the fear. We'll walk with you. We will not let you fall. And if you do fall at any point, we're going to pick you up again. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.